If you're a nerd, you might enjoy this topic. If not, then you're unlikely to be entertained and you should go watch something less dumb. What I'm about to teach you is nothing less than the obscure and rarely useful topic known as bit manipulation, which nevertheless is a source of joy in an otherwise dull life. If you're still here, it must be because you're about to burst with excitement to hear what it is about, so I will tell you. Bit manipulation is the art of using your knowledge of binary to make efficient, lightweight and absolutely beautiful code. If that sounds like a noble pursuit to you, then let's get going. If you're on Windows and want an easy way to follow along with the calculations in here yourself, the built-in calculator has some very handy functionality in the programmer tab. To understand this topic, you need to know binary and you must be familiar with logical operations. I'll go through both now, so you can look in the description for timestamps to skip the parts that you already know about. Binary is a base 2 number system, meaning it only contains the digits 0 and 1. Computers make use of it as 1 and 0 can be represented by an electrical current being on and off, and it also happens to neatly correspond to true and false. Decimal, the number system that you are used to, is base 10, meaning there are 10 different digits. In both of these number systems, the position of each digit in a number is significant, as its value is multiplied by an amount corresponding to its position. As you know, in base 10, the first digit from the right is multiplied by 1, the second is multiplied by 10, the third by 100, and so on. So it's multiplied by 10 to the power of the index of the position, starting at 0. Finally, the total value of the number is the sum of all this. Binary works the exact same, but with 2 instead of 10. For example, to represent the number 103 in decimal, you write 1, 0, 3, meaning 100 plus 0 plus 3. In binary, you write 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, meaning 64 plus 32 plus 0 plus 0 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. Addition of numbers works exactly the same in binary as it does in decimal. When talking about binary in computers, each digit in a number is called a bit. Be aware that numbers have a fixed amount of bits and if you go beyond that it's called an overflow and you lose information that was supposed to be stored on the higher digits. A regular int in C sharp has 32 bits giving it a range of about 4 billion. A relevant question though is how to deal with negative numbers. We're used to just putting a minus in front of the number, but that of course doesn't work on a computer which only has access to ones and zeros. Instead, the most significant bit, meaning the leftmost one, is reserved to work as a plus or minus. So if it's a zero, it means the number is positive, and if it's a one, it means the number is negative. When reserving a bit like this, we say that the number is signed. It of course also means that we have one bit less to represent the absolute value of the number, meaning we can't write as large numbers as we could before. Going back to the 32-bit integer, this means that instead of being able to represent numbers between 0 and 4 billion, we can now represent numbers between minus 2 billion and plus 2 billion. There is more to this, however, because just saying that the first bit suddenly means something else than it did before of course doesn't change anything at all from the perspective of the computer. It still just sees some numbers, and if we were to take, for example, 5 and add our invented minus 5, we would not get 0. The maths happen to work out so that this problem can be solved by something called 2's complement. To make a number negative, we don't only make the first bit into a 1, we reverse the value of every single bit. After that, we add a 1 to it. With this system, we can see that adding 5 and our negative 5 indeed does give 0, so hooray for that. If this part about negative numbers didn't really make sense to you, it's okay. It's not horribly important for what we're doing, as long as you're aware that binary isn't exactly intuitive when it comes to negative numbers. So if you experience weird behavior at some point when messing around with bit manipulation, you'll at least have a hint about why. Now let's talk about logical operations. You're used to them from conditional statements, such as checking if two booleans are true with the AND operator. It takes two booleans and outputs a single value, which is true only if both inputs are true. 
there are three other operators worth caring about. Or, which is true if either or both inputs are true. XOR, which is true if exactly one input is true. NOT, which takes a single input and just reverses it. It is worth taking a look at the first three operators and considering what happens if you pass in boolean A and either true or false with a given operator. For example, if you say A and true, the result will be whatever A is. The same is the case for OR and XOR if you pass in false. And in the case of XOR, if you pass in true, the result will be the opposite of A. Now, what if I told you that these logical operations also work on binary numbers and that they actually are the fundamental building blocks of computer hardware? Better yet, we can also make use of them in C Sharp. This looks almost identical to what you're used to, but now we only use a single symbol instead of two. So an ampersand for AND, a pipe for OR, and a caret for XOR. For NOT, you use tilde. Now, instead of giving booleans as input, you just give numbers, and the operations are executed at each bit in turn, giving a new number in the end. Here are some examples to stare at. I hope you got it all, because now I want to give a little teaser of what can be done with this. Let's say you have an integer that you want to swap between 0 and 1. Perhaps you use it as the index for an array with a length of 2. Instead of writing some conditional statement to check the current value of the number and then setting the proper value, you can simply swap it by giving it the value of index xor1. If index was 0, it's now 1. If it was 1, it's now 0. The last thing that we need to know about before we really can get to the good stuff is bit shifting. It is simply about moving all bits of a number an amount of steps either to the left or the right. The symbol for this is a double angle bracket in the wanted direction. So you can for example take the number 12 and move the bits one step to the left turning it into the number 24, or you could move them two steps to the right turning it into the number 3. Moving bits to the left turns out to have the effect of multiplying the number by 2 to the power of steps moved, as you're essentially just adding zeros in front of the number. Moving them to the right is essentially the same as removing zeros, so it has the effect of dividing the number by 2 to the power of steps moved, just as it works in decimal when you multiply and divide by powers of 10. I know I said that bit shifting was the last thing you needed to know before moving on, but I lied. I want to give a few words of warning first. While bit manipulation is extremely fast, it can be quite difficult for humans to understand what's going on. After all, when using this in actual code, you're only able to see the numbers represented in decimal form while you're working with the underlying binary representation of them. If I for example calculate 6 and 3, the result will be 2. That only makes sense if you think about how these numbers are written in binary. Always remember to make your intent as clear as possible when programming so that yourself and others can understand what is going on. The second word of warning is to make use of parentheses all the time when working with this. You think you understand the order that the operations are done in, but you don't. So make it explicit to avoid any problems. With all this new knowledge, we are now ready to take on my favorite use case for bit manipulation, bit masks. The fundamental idea is to use an integer as an extremely lightweight boolean array where each bit represents a value. For example, if you have the number 5, it means that the values of index 0 and 2 are true, while the value of index 1 and everything else is false. Of course, the size of this array is limited by the amount of bits in the number, but when you just need a small array, this is absolutely genius. Let's walk through the essential associated operations for this. We'll say I have an int called mask, which represents my boolean array. If I wanted to start with index 2 and 4 on, I can set it equal to 1 shifted 2 bits to the left, plus 1 shifted 4 bits to the left. To check if bit number n is on, I can use the AND operator on the mask and a 1 switched n bits to the left. If the result is not 0, it means the bit is on. So if I for example want to check if bit 2 is on, I write if mask and 1 shifted to the left by 2 is not equal to 0. 
If I want to set a particular bit to true, I apply the OR operator to the mask and a 1 switched end bits to the left. I could, for example, turn on the third bit by writing mask OR equals 1 switched to the left by 3. Similarly, you can flip the value of a given bit by doing the same but with XOR. Here is an example where we flip the third bit, meaning it will be turned off again. You can also turn off a bit directly by applying the AND operator on the mask and the negated version of one switched end bit to the left. This one is a bit trickier to understand, but see what happens if I for example use it to turn off the second bit. All other bits in the mask keep their values. Here's a couple of other operations that might come in useful. You can make a mask with all bits with an index lower than n turned on by switching a 1 n bit to the left and subtracting 1. Here's an example with 4. Be careful of overflows when doing this. Finally, if you understand how negative numbers work in binary, you can make use of it to show you the least significant bit that is on by writing mask and negative mask. This works because you add an extra 1 when turning the number negative. For our example, we'd see that the lowest index that it's on is 4. It is worth keeping in mind that while I here have showed the operations with single indices at a time, there's no reason you can't do it with multiple. This way, you can also do operations on entire bit masks, perhaps even better known as set operations. If you have two bit masks, A and B, you can, for example, get the union of them with OR, meaning you end up with a mask where all bits that were on in either A or B are on. You can get the intersection with AND, which gives you a mask where each bit is on only if it was on in both A and B. And you can get the difference with the combination of AND and NOT, where you end up with a mask where each bit is on only if it was on in A, but not in B. Naturally, this all works very well with enums as they really just are named numbers, or in this case, named indices. Let's for example have an enum representing weekdays. By itself, a variable of this type can only hold a single weekday, but with a mask, we can store any combination of the seven days. In fact, c -sharp directly supports this through the flags attribute in the system namespace. If you slap this onto an enum, any variable of that type will now automatically work as a bit mask and be able to hold multiple of the enum options. So, if an enum normally is a bunch of named integers, this is essentially a bit mask with named indices. When doing this, you should also manually give the options values that are powers of 2 starting at 1. Besides making it a whole lot easier to work with, doing this will make the toString method give output that is actually useful. Note that when you now create your bit masks, you're not allowed to use addition to combine options, but using OR will have the same effect. Since the majority of our audience probably is here to learn about Unity, let me show you a very real example of this in there. You may never have thought about it, but layers in Unity are actually just enums. Furthermore, layer masks are really just bit masks, and you can easily treat them as such. I can make a new layer mask and set it to have the layer number 3 and 5 on just like this. If I head into Unity, it will show up like this. Similarly, I can just check if a particular layer is on in the layer mask. Hopefully this gives you some inspiration about how to use this knowledge. Well, that was really just that. I hope you enjoyed. Bye.